Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That means in the name of our Lord, the most gracious, the most merciful. That's how we start this program. I'm going to first ask uh, Imam Musa, who's all here present, to open officially open the program with uh, dua or a uh, prayer. <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahmani Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Din, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen, Sirat Al-Ladhina Na'amta Alayhim, Wa'ilin Nafudi Alayhim Wa Rafa'in. Ameen. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Praise be to Allah. Master, master of the uh, worlds, most gracious, most merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment, you alone will seek help, guide us along the straight path, the path of those on whom you have bestowed your favor, not the path of those who receive your anger or ministry. Amen. For those of you who are not that familiarized with CARE, the organization who's organizing this event, presenting this event, the Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, we are a council of chapters throughout the nation. Uh, each chapter is run autonomously, uh, and this is one branch of the Florida chapter. We have three offices. Uh, we have an office here, close to here in Sunrise. Uh, we have another office in Tampa, and a third office that we recently opened a year and a half ago, two years ago in Orlando. Uh, we have close to seven, 16, 17 uh, full-time employees. Now we have six full-time attorneys as part of our staff. We are a civil rights organization and uh, the main purpose is to enhance the understanding of Islam. Uh, we want to encourage dialogue within our community and among the different communities we strive to protect the civil liberties. That's why you see a staff, a strong legal staff, six full-time uh, attorneys. Uh, we have paralegals also working in our staff. Uh, we want to empower our community, uh, growing community, steadily growing community. Uh, just here in the Tri-County area, uh, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade, we estimate that there, we must have over 150,000 Muslims. In the state of Florida, there are other unofficial estimates that there should be around three-fourths of a million Muslims here, 700, over 700,000 Muslims living in Florida, in the state of Florida. Uh, it is that community that we want to empower, empower civically, that we want them to get more, educate them as to their civic duties, uh, very pertinent in these days and uh, Paradise, our first speaker, uh, speaker will ab uh, abound on this area on how important, how the Muslim community have developed into a broader civic engagement, especially when it comes to politics, right? Uh, also, we want to build coalitions coalitions within our community and with other communities uh, to promote justice and understanding. We are committed to protect the civil rights not only of our community but of all citizens that seek our help. Uh, you'll be surprised we do have and receive clientele that are non-Muslims uh, to, to seeking assistance with immigration matters, seeking assistance with civil rights matters. Uh, Recently had a client who's a non-Muslim uh, Arab uh, seeking some legal assistance from our office and so on and so on. So the, the services we offer are not limited to the Muslim community but for the broader spectrum of the community, although the vast majority of our clients are within, our Muslim, uh, within the Muslim community. Uh, our core principle, and this is so uh, uh, pertinent today, our core principle is the condemnation of all acts of violence against civilians by an individual, by any organization, or by any state. 
we this is what we have always stand for. Uh, this is not a core principle that we brought up today or brought up after September 11th or brought up after the terrorist attacks. It has been a core principle of care since it, its inception and since its creation. Uh, we are often asked why, where are your voices when terrorist attacks happen? Uh, where are the Muslim voices condemning the ter terrorist attacks? And we are many voices uh, condemning the terrorist attacks. Unfortunately, uh, what attracts the media attention the most is, are not the condemnation of the terrorist acts, but those acts. Uh, and this is what happened. But if you Google, for example, uh, Muslim American Muslims condemn um, any of the terrorist attacks, you will find thousands, thousands of entries of the not only care, the different communities throughout America and internationally condemning each and every terrorist attack. Uh, what do we do in the ground regarding extremism and terrorism? In the past, just in the past six months, CARE has conducted over 40 safety and security trainings where one of the topics is precisely how the community should deal with extremism and terrorism. The community is, in those trainings, some of the things that are addressed are how the community should be directly involved in preventing extremism and what to do if we identify an extremist element within our community or an extremist element attacking or attempting to attack our community. Uh, we, are, we have been very proactive, probably more than the press knows, and probably more than the general public knows, and probably more than the own community knows how active our community leadership is in regarding denouncing extremism, identifying extremism, denouncing it, and taking it to the appropriate uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, not so long ago, I was personally in the FBI offices uh, helping in an investigation dealing with a Muslim woman here in South Florida who departed to Turkey and eventually joined ISIS with her two toddlers. Uh, those are the kind of events that don't make it to the news, but just an example of how directly involved our community are uh, is with this of extremism and terrorism. And most of these approaches of, from our community to the, to the law enforcement are, don't, don't make it to the media because precisely they're made in a concealed, uh, secretive way. This is, or these are ongoing, very, uh, very serious invest investigations, criminal in nature, involving sometimes international elements, and this, while they're conducting the investigation and our community is engaged with the law enforcement cooperating with these investigations, do not make it to the news necessarily. Uh, there are other things that our community are, are doing to prevent extremism. Uh, when we detect extremists who don't, uh, have not engaged in any criminal activity, if we denounce that to the law enforcement authorities, very little they can do. As a matter of fact, in a recent meeting we had with the uh, Department of Justice and FBI and other federal law enforcement agencies, they openly uh, uh, recognized that they have zero budget to prevent extremism. There are law enforcement agencies. So if we tell them, hey, there's a guy here saying some stuff that doesn't sound right with some antisocial behavior. If he has not committed a crime, what can they do? So it is up to our community to, and we have stepped up, to identify those, those individuals and provide a holistic approach to those individuals with professionals of, of, uh, on theology, on psychological and medical services, on legal services, on social services. Let me give you an example. Prior to the Boston bombings, 
one of those brothers involved in the in the terrorist attack was attending a Friday prayer, the Juma prayer, and the Imam in that Boston mosque was addressing the community and was talking about Martin Luther King. And one of these brothers stood up and said, you cannot talk in a mosque about a Christian. He's not a Muslim. He's a Kufar, a non-believer. What did the community do? The community said, go out of this community. You don't belong here. Did that help? We see the results, what happened afterwards. So if that individual would have been approached by the community and provided assistance by an imam, an attorney, law enforcement, medical, psychological, probably also uh, social services, probably a terrorist attack could have been prevented. So it is following that kind of need that our community um, care has developed a team of experts. So when we do have a case of extremism in our community, we have the appropriate tools to deal with those individuals and provide better service and protect our community. Uh, we cannot not, uh, lose the perspective that the main victims of terrorism are Muslims. ISIS have killed more Muslims than Christians, Jews, and unbelievers together. So the main victims, and you should keep in mind, of the terrorists and extremists is the Muslim community. And we're made to victimize twice because we're direct victims of their terrorist act. And then we also need to deal with the stereotypes that, that we carry after this event. 34, uh, there are reports that have close to 34, 34 people dead in the Brussels attacks, over 170 injured. But how many of you were aware that on March 13, 37 people were killed in a car bomb in Turkey, and over 100 were injured? Uh, Paris, 130 people dead. Uh, but the day before Paris, how many of you were aware that 43 people were killed in a terrorist attack in Lebanon? Uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo, January 2015, 17 dead in Paris. How many of you were aware that on that same month, 2,000 people, 2,000 people were murdered by Boko Haram in Nigeria, <coughs> same month? So this is what we want to call the attention to. We need to portray terrorism as it is. Terrorism does not have a particular religion, a particular ethnicity. It could come from the right, from the left, from Muslims, Christians, Jews, or atheists. Uh, it could have uh, race motivators. It could have supremacy motivators. It could be political, it could be religious, it could be anywhere. And the victims are the civilians, all civilians. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce a good friend of mine that is uh, also a reporter. Her name is Paradise Afshar. Paradise, I asked her for a brief bio to introduce her. And she sent me uh, something for my personal uh, consumption that I'm not going to keep it personal, I'm going to read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Paradise is a mild-mannered reporter who denies her coffee addiction. <laughs> She's also a champ at the Trivia Crack and holds a top score in the arcade basketball and always parks inside the lines. Don't fact check that, she asked me. Okay. No, Paradise is the, is the digital editor for Channel 10. Uh, prior to joining the digital platform of Channel 10, she was a reporter for the Miami Herald. Uh, she covered Miami-Dade County communities, uh, health, and faith issues. She has written about the local Syrian refugees, broken stories about scandals inside town hall, and told the stories of people who have survived medical issues. Paradise launched her career in Brandon Town Herald, where, where she worked as a crime reporter. 
In Brand Letter, she mainly wrote mm -hmm. about car accidents and violent crimes, in addition to her share of wacky Florida stories, including the time the Manatee County Sheriff's Office spent three hours chasing a chicken outside the courthouse. True story, guys. <laughs> Paradise received an undergraduate degree in mass communication from FIU and a master's in Middle Eastern studies from King College in London. Uh, Paradise is a fan of LA Lakers. Uh, <laughs> and then goes here with the heat <laughs> and, and has a, an assigned share in the Starbucks she frequents. Thank you, Paradise, for... Also, I recognize many of you from the times I will call you and say, hey, can you talk to me for this? So it's good to have all my sources in the same place at once. Um, so I'm here to talk about basically Muslims in the upcoming election. And for worse or for better, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to Muslims in the upcoming election. And, you know, sadly, with the news coming out of Brussels, I pretty much know that my life will be that much harder in the next couple of weeks because there will probably be something said by a certain candidate that will make life more fun. Um, and I'm not saying that to softball anything, but I saw it happen earlier this year when the tax happened in Paris. There was a string of activity down here. There was a mosque that got hate mail. There was another, there was a school that had somebody write F Muslims on the side of it. And there was a genuine fear among the community. But what I always tell everyone about the uniqueness of South Florida's faith community in general is how there, there's not too many divisions here. I mean, the faith communities tend to work fairly well with each other. Cosmos tends to work well with the Jewish community. I remember when there was an attack at one of the mosques five years ago, six years ago now, I'm sorry. The um, One of the rabbis came out and said, well, this is a hate crime, because the FBI wasn't calling it that. And they were saying, if this happened at my temple, you would call this a hate crime. And you're having Jews standing up for Muslims, and Muslims standing up for Jews and Christians. So it is very unique down here. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about really, South Florida's ahead of the game in a lot of this. And I love South Florida for this, because we are what people should be looking at, not only in terms of Muslims, but in terms of the way we view diversity down here is very important. And especially when it comes to elections, and I was listening to NPR the other day, now I'm a news nerd, and they were saying something about how every four years we kind of get personal with our politicians and ask them questions about their faith, and we normally don't ask people these questions. Like, we'll ask them things like, how often do you pray? And when we pray, what do you pray for? And then we judge them on their answers, which is really fun, because we don't do this to normal people in normal life. Like, I wouldn't go up to any of you and say, what do you pray for? Well, why don't you pray for this? Like, it, it doesn't happen, but we do it. And then, what, so you expect that going into religion, like, you know, any election season. But what I didn't expect this election season was to have things like, so do you think all Muslims are terrorists, or just some of them? And, you know, to have those questions be legitimate questions that these politicians are getting. And to have their answers be things like what Donald Trump said a while ago of, yeah, pretty much. I think all Muslims hate Americans. And when Rick Scott was asked the same question a few weeks ago, he didn't answer the question. His answer to the question, his literal answer was, we have a lot of diversity in Florida. He didn't answer the question. He got kicked off Morning Joe because he did not answer the question as he was asked three times. So this to me just says how much more people need to come out and really speak up to these politicians and let them know that Muslims are here and they vote. <laughs> and I think that's the important part of all of it. You know, I was talking to a friend a while ago who is a staunch Donald Trump supporter. And I was talking to him about the comment he made about you know, all Muslims need to be out, we shouldn't allow Muslims inside the country until we figure what's going on, whatever that means. And his response was, yeah, but it got people talking. Yeah, but was it really some conversation that we needed to have? I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, security and the actual security, we should talk about ISIS recruits from social media. Maybe censorship would be a great conversation to have. You know, does Twitter, Facebook, Instagram have a responsibility to take these things down when they're posted? How much control should the government have over these issues? That's a substance conversation, not let's keep everyone out until we figure out what's going on. We're never going to figure out what's going on. Um, and so, again, being a nerd, I started searching through the internet 
over what do Muslims even vote for? And now, because I was constantly told that Muslims tend to be Republican and Muslims tend to be very, very conservative. And of course, until I fact checked this, I don't believe any of it. So I went ahead and did that. And it turns out they were wrong. <laughs> Most Muslims are not Republicans. Most Muslims are Democrat, actually. About 44% are Democrat. About 6% are Republicans. It's according to the latest research from the ISPU. And the rest are independent. And the independent vote's really cool because just in 2011 when the Pew Research Center did the same kind of study, the numbers were about 19% of Muslims were independent. So you're having a lot more Muslims going towards those independents. And we all want, we always hear about how the politicians want that independent vote. Well, you kind of have to go into those Muslims to get it, don't you? And the sad part that I found where Muslims were the least likely to engage in the political process of those of the five top largest faith communities in the country. And that's one thing that may possibly need to change in order to get a vote out. We always hear politicians talk about what do we need to do to get the black vote. Bernie Sanders was in, resonating well with black voters. Hillary Clinton was resonating better with older than younger. I mean, you have all these little demographics. Muslims need to become one of those demographics that they're fighting for. You know, just like Hispanics have done an amazing job of immigrating to the country and becoming a political powerhouse, the same thing can very well be emulated. And we've seen it here. We have totally seen it here with and around the country. I mean, the same rhetoric that said in Arizona would never fly in, yes, places like Michigan, like the abortion, which you have a high Muslim population, but also places like Virginia and in New York where the populations get so big that even the Republican candidates who, yes, one part of the party may be saying anti-Muslim things like, oh, they want to push Sharia law in this country and all that stuff, but you have, in the same places, they'll take pictures of themselves at mosques. I've seen Republican candidates at mosques down here. It's a little, you get a different vibe from them. And about 71% of Muslims say that um, have a positive view of immigration in this country. I think that's probably why you get more of the Democrats and the independents when it comes out of those, because, yeah. Um, and honestly, from my experience being down here and just covering all of this, my biggest thing is we need to maybe up our game a little bit. I mean, Muslim Americans need to just work at it. And the beautiful thing about South Florida is that they are working at it. I get emails all the time from you, from Everett from Cosmos, if you know Shabir and he has an email address, you are getting emails from him. Um, you, and I love the fact that it's working down here. And I think South Florida can be a model of what the rest of the country needs to do in order to gain that Muslim vote and also to figure out what exactly Muslim candidates want because unfortunately, unless you speak up, it allows people like the Donald Trumps in the world, like the Scots in the world, and I don't want to pick on the Republicans, but you haven't heard anything from the Democratic side saying these things and really ostracizing the whole group. If they were saying this about any other group, I think it would be people would be a lot quicker to respond. You would never. If Rick Scott had said something like we said about the Muslims not responding about the Hispanic community down here, I feel like there'd be a lot more outrage. So I think it goes both ends. But you do have people like me who are obsessed with covering this stuff who. Have, you know, got a degree in Middle Eastern Studies just so she can cover this stuff more. So <laughs> I am there. So please email me with any story ideas. But I'd love to hear from you guys and honestly learn what's important to you when you vote because every demographic is different and I think it's important to get these voices out, especially when I think since 9-11 the Muslim <clears throat> voice has been getting stronger in this community and I think that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. First of all, I thank God Almighty for blessing us to be here. And I ask God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we say in Arabic, to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of God be upon the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family members, his companions, and may the peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon all the messengers and prophets that God sent to the world. I greet you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you. 
as brother Wilfredo said, it's not a lecture program. And I want to thank Kier for inviting me to be here. Actually, I came in 3 o'clock this morning from New York. Because I didn't want to miss this, I understand how important it is. I thought that I have to be here. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I know we have Muslim representatives and media representatives here. So I just want to mention two points in the fact, 10 minutes given to me. I felt like I was in paradise here in paradise people. That's a good bond and a good blend with your background, Middle East, the West, and your exposure to Islam, and your combination with Muslims and the media, and the political punch, that's powerful. Very interesting. Uh, it, it's, it's a blessing to work with you, and I know the Cosmos is working a lot with the media. So my two points I want to share, it's about Muslims and the media. Because we have, in this media breakfast, I got to mention about the media. We don't need to talk about terrorism and what's going on, Brother Wilfredo has went down in details. You saw the document. There's two points I want to mention to myself, to you, so that we can all be reminded of a very important issue with my little experience. I've been around for 40 years lecturing on Islam. Yeah, I started at the age of 16, 17. The first point is, and I will say that to our Muslim representatives who are here, I would like to refer to President Obama's speech a couple of weeks ago at the masjid in Baltimore, Maryland, when he said, when he was asked about terrorism, and I'm putting this in a nutshell, and I'm sure all of you heard this, when a non-Muslim commits a terrorist act, I mean, yeah, a Christian or a Jew or whoever, the entire Jewish community or Christian community are not blamed. But when a Muslim commits a terrorist act, the entire Muslims and the Muslim community are blamed. And if you would recall what President Obama said, and he's a very smart guy, you know that. That's why he became president. That's why he's in Cuba. He's very <laughs> international, very diverse. He said, and we don't need to tell America this. The president said it. Everybody knows this. Muslims are engineers. They're businessmen. They're doctors. They contribute to the United States of America. Donald Trump knows that also. Hillary knows that. All politicians know that. When they pull up the statistics, they know who voted and who did not vote. That's the facts. So everybody knows that. We're trying to impress Americans that we are doctors and businessmen and lawyers doesn't make much of a difference. Because you can't beat Donald Trump in being a good businessman, right? I don't know what a good politician he'll make, but a good businessman. But he has gotten the votes. So whether we like it or not, he made it a great point. And that's reality, right? That doesn't mean he's going to be a good friend of everybody. And he's going to really lead us in the right path. That's a whole different scenario. So my point is we don't need to be defending terrorism anymore. That, that's very really interesting, right? Because, you know, I have come from a Christian background. I have been preaching... This terrorism thing have been attacked by Jews, Christians, all over the place. Personally, publicly. And it's a whole different world. And that's why I'm combining all my two points with the Muslim and the media. President Obama said, yes, they contribute. And he said, I would like to share, share a little Christian proverb or saying. In which Jesus, peace be upon him, said, let the light shine. Do you know what that means? When Jesus spoke about let the light shine, he meant spread the word of God. Spread the word of God. Because he, he was a man of spreading the word. And if you listen to Christians preach, it's spread the word. As Muslims, we need to spread the word of the Quran. And it doesn't matter what we try to defend. Listen, the government knows, the law enforcement knows. And I love that statement of President Obama. He said, we know what you do. But if you spread the word of, spread the light, let the light shine meant, let the Quran spread. Let the world know more about what is Islam, who are Muslims, the positive things that we do, that we should be doing all over. That was the President of America's statement, not mine. Not my advice. And I think that's what Christians did. They let the light shine. 
So if a Christian guy bombs that building, nobody's going to question priests and Christians about, are you guys terrorists? The world. Because the message has already been spread. It's all over the hospitals, all over the world. Who are Christians and what they are. And that's my point to the Muslims here. We need to spend some more time. If it means buying a station of time on the media, but that's probably too expensive. You see, we will build a mosque for $10 million, but cannot spend $10,000 for a good Muslim ad on television. We've got to change our line of thinking. And I'm saying this because I have been a media boy from the Caribbean on television. I had my own talk shows and my own television shows for many, many, many years. That's why my son is a, he's a news editor at NBC today. Because I've always loved media. I got the Alikma TV online. And I'm telling Muslims, spend some more time in propagating this light of Islam on the media. We should have a channel on the national television network, like TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network. Something. Cut down the tens of millions of dollars we spend in mosques. And building and sh yeah, chandeliers is good for a restaurant. But I don't know why a masjid should have a hundred thousand dollars chandelier. If we had put that on the media, right, Brother Wilfredo, and put an ad about Islam, you see what politicians spend, spend to propagate. That's how. That's how Donald Trump is where he is. He spent a lot of money to, for his campaign. And if you want to beat Donald Trump, we should have been spending money like that. And one of you could have been the president of America. It doesn't matter. So that's my one point about the Muslims. And I'm only referring to what President Obama said. My point to the media, I think we have passed the days when you need to go. This might be a little hard. No, no. But this is reality. We have passed the days when a Muslim, or whatever happened in Brussels this morning or in Paris, going to a masjid and meeting Brother Khalid Mirza and Brother, what you Muslims do, what is happening. You know what? Terrorism is a crime. It's like drugs, it's like criminals down the street, murderers. Muslims are 1.5 billion people. We can never stop these radicals and extremists from doing what they're doing. If Obama or, or Trump or Hillary tells me that they can stop drugs in America, well, brother, I will start preaching and supporting them. If they tell me they will stop crime in America, vote for me to the president, to be the president, whoever says that, I think we should all go with that. That's going to clean up a lot of corruption. But you can't stop that. We could work towards cleaning it up. It's like inherited in society and the evil of man and woman today. So terrorism is that. What I think the media should be interviewing when there is a terrorist, terrorist actor is go talk to the FBI, the CIA. The law enforcement people who are supposed to be doing a better job. You made an interesting statement. They don't have the budget, right? But that's not an ex excuse. That's where the problem is. Think what I'm saying. Here is a terrorist. It doesn't matter if he's a Muslim or non-Muslim. Do you know a lot of the terrorist people now are converts? Non-Muslims who have been brainwashed and brought into the field and brought into the field to do terrorist act as a cover-up? I'm not supposed to know that. You're not supposed to know that. Is it law enforcement, the CIA and the FBI, the, the sheriff, the, all the law enforcement in whatever category they work. That's where the media needs to go and say, Sir, are you guys doing your job? Did you know so and so was happening? What is all of this about? The poor Imam has no clue. Do you know a regular, regular Muslim going to a mosque has no clue who is a terrorist? They don't even know the sign of a terrorist. I've been around in areas, I've spoken to people, once when I, when I not really accused, but I made terrorist statements here about signs of certain terrorists. And I'm talking about 15, 10, 15 years ago, that there are certain signs in certain territories and certain this. I had Muslims condemn me and say that I'm attacking the Muslims. Because I have worked, I have met, I have known many people who have fell into terrorism. Listen, I taught. Jose Padilla personally, I've been the teacher of Jose Padilla, the man that the government has, the man called Adnan al-Shukri, $5 million was on his head in America, used to lead spray in my mosque. He made a proposal to marry my daughter. So I'm talking to the top terrorists known in America and I've kind of known them personally. 
been part of teaching them. I was going through London once and I saw in the Time magazine, teacher of suspected terrorists, Jose Padilla, and it was my picture they had. Instead of putting his picture, they put mine. So I had first-hand experience with these kind of guys. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not giving you a theory and idea. That's only two people I'm telling you. So I conclude now, my friends, my brothers, elders, everyone, two messages. Muslims, we got a job, spread the message, let the light shine. Like where you have criminals and drug lords among Christians, that will continue in the world with human beings. We will always have these terrorists. They have their own personal agenda, their grievances, and they will use Islam to kill us, to kill Muslims, non-Muslims, Christians, anybody. That's the name of the game. And the media, yes, I know it's nice, and I, I know media is all about negative news. That's what makes the news. That's what's creative. I mean, that's what sells, right? Trump, critical statements, whatever. That's what sells. That's reality. But um, please, take this back to your boards. You need to investigate and see if the intelligence department are doing their work properly. Listen, if the FBI could investigate Hillary Clinton, I don't see why they can't investigate terrorists, right? And she's such an ideal person. I'm not making a pitch for her to vote for her, I'm just saying she's ideal. But if they could interrogate her and investigate her, why shouldn't they be checking areas where there's suspicious people? And I don't care who they are, they will also find people who are not Muslims, who are part of this terrorism plot. And hence I say the media, you need to target law enforcement a lot. That may boost their intelligence, boost the government to spend more money, but better budget, so that they can do more fine work, and not only look for criminals after the terrorist act has taken place, but can do a lot more work before. And the last point, though, is when you keep on going into the mosque and investigating the Muslims, which you should do to a point, but don't let that alone be the case, then the non-Muslims down the street, street the Donald Trump followers, the anti-Muslims would think that this is a Muslim thing. It's all about mosques, it's all about Muslims, but these are the people that the media are talking to. And that makes us look like bigger criminals. You get my point? Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being with you.